I wasn't interested in growing up. I always looked at grown-ups and thought that they didn't seem to be having as much fun as kids that were running around playing and having fun. And I always thought that grown-ups just looked a little bit stiff and straight. And I always figured there was more fun to be had in life. So I was never very keen on growing up. So I haven't really. <laughs> Every time I hang out with Chuck Berry, it's always like a, one of the craziest, coolest life experiences I've ever had. He's very calculated with what he does, yet there's something about Chuck that at any time, he'll pull something random out and just blow your mind. As a little John, Right from when he was really little, he had to be doing something all the time and it had to be something that captured his imagination. He is the oldest of uh, my five children. I was born in Palmerston North, up the North Island. In 1966, school was a hoot. I was always maybe a tiny bit mischievous at school. Uh, might have acted the goat a little bit. Uh, but really fond memories, uh, Christmas holidays, school holidays, travelling around the countryside with the family, going to rivers and beaches and bushwalks and tramps. He joined Cubs when he was quite young and became an avid member of the scouting fraternity. We had the most fantastic scout leader and set a lot of challenges and a lot of outdoor stuff and learned how to tie knots and how to start a fire and how to cook for yourself in the bush. And all of those really neat sort of life skills, that, the kind of stuff that I still use frequently today. I think I got into model planes through the birthday and Christmas presents that my dad gave me. I think he thought he would really like to be a bird and from what he's developed and got involved with since, he's probably got the closest to being a bird that he might have. When I was 16, I saved up uh, $400 from helping to paint my mum's house with my neighbour, and that paid for my very first set of radio control gear. And that was a really huge leap in what I could do with my model planes. And up until then, I'd been flying free flight planes or control line planes. And this was the first time I could have a motorised plane that I could actually throw away and control around the sky. So that really changed my model aircraft hobby a lot. But one of the big things I really did learn from models was a whole raft of aviation related knowledge. Things like theory of flight, how a plane flies, how an engine works. And that was a really good grounding to have when I got into Air New Zealand as an apprentice in 1985 as a mechanical aircraft engineer and worked there for nine years. From being an avid builder of, of model aeroplanes when he was a little boy and hanging them off his bedroom ceiling to having his own actual aeroplane that flies, that he built himself, has, has been a great journey. and. Um, yeah, it's fantastic that he's, he's accomplished that. One of the things that kept me in the shed right through the process of building the microlight was a wild dream of flying the plane to the west coast and using it as a tool to access the backcountry, find cliffs. Early start to come out to Wanaka Airfield and get the plane ready, put everything together I need to cross country across to Martins Bay on the west coast. We heard about Chuck's plane being built for a long time, so of a very high standard. First looking inside the plane it looks like a cockpit of a 737 with you know, glass cockpit uh, GPS's and, and all the instrumentation he's got. He's certainly an uh, engineer, you know, right through and through. 
Morning, good traffic, Charlie Delta Charlie, rolling for takeoff front way 29. It's uh, got a sense of achievement, it's something I've always wanted to do. And, you know, I've gone out there and I, I did spend three years in the shed. Sometimes these things take an extraordinary effort to make them happen. And I'm glad to say I've finally made it happen. Like going to the west coast, is, there's a lot of skills that need to be learned before you can go to a place like that. Navigation is a really big one. There's a lot of mountains between Wanaka and the West Coast. As an aviator, with respect to the Southern Alps and weather, you know, we can have in the morning a nice fine morning to evening to severe gale, 160 km an hour winds blowing through, through the Alps. You know, Chuck's got to be very careful, can rip little aeroplanes to bits. You know, it's a free world when you're up in the air, it's three dimensional, it's nice and fast. It uh, doesn't matter which way up you are anymore. Wow. Nice. It was absolutely amazing. Today, I turned my wild idea into my reality. Fresh from the sea, New Zealand's very own delicacy, the crayfish. Absolutely gorgeous and power to go with it. What could be finer? I've had a lot of firsts today. First time I've been diving in the west coast down this way. First time I landed a plane at Martins Bay. First time I caught a crayfish while snorkeling. That's a first. So, fantastic. Yeah, it's been a great day. Oh, flying home, sensational. The trip between Martins Bay and Wanaka is completely studded by mountains. You've got the main Southern Alps, which is the main mountain range running down the length of the South Island. And so it was just absolutely beautiful, being able to fly down lakes, fly in amongst glaciers, fly past waterfalls. Yeah, so uh, what was I doing? Looking for base jumping sites. Yeah, what a treat actually. Um, that was the big thing with this aeroplane. I put uh, a lot of work into making it good for backcountry operations. To find a good jumpable cliff, you need a whole range of different things. It has to be high enough. It's got to be sheer enough. There must be a launch point that you can get to somehow. And it's got to have a landing area. It does take quite a bit to actually find a new cliff. And then once you see it, then the back of your mind starts working away and getting a bit familiar with it. Because when you do face up to a challenge, you learn something about yourself and you... And especially with the kind of stuff that I like to do, which um, has a bit of jeopardy associated with it. You know, those challenges that you face up where you could kill yourself if you make a mistake. It really does give you a sense of... not You're not using your fear as a barrier. So you're actually getting past that. And, once you can get past your fears as a barrier, then you can do anything. That's one of those things that he'd always wanted to do, so awesome. And the fact that he virtually built everything on it himself uh, is, is, I think, is fantastic. When I'd go down at various stages, I would he'd give me a conductive tour, and he was so proud of the fact that he'd added this bit extra and that bit extra and look how it works and these lights flash and most of it didn't mean a lot to me obviously but um, it did to him. But I love turning a wild idea into a reality. I've been the New Zealand speed hang gliding champion for the last few years flying down hills at high speed around a slalom race course. Yeah, one of my favourite photographs I choreographed with a friend called Woolly Man and a lady called Lee. And I wanted to get a photo of Lee standing on the back of my friend flying his wingsuit. And she got into position and stood up on the, the back of Woolly Man while he's flying his wingsuit. And she stood up there in the perfect position, was there for about a quarter of a second. 
but I got the photo. I was asked to come up with a stunt for the Jack Osborne TV show. And I've done a bunch of canyon swings in the past, and I'd always thought how much fun would it be to do a swing under a helicopter. And next thing I found myself at the top of a cliff just outside Queenstown, attached to a great big long rope with a helicopter on one end of it. And next thing I know, the helicopter pulls me off the edge of the cliff into the biggest rope swing I've ever done. 100 metre rope swing. As smooth as anything, gentle as anything. Totally sensational. My first major project with Red Bull was Alpha Bravo, and that was to skydive from an aeroplane and fly a wingsuit across the very tip of the North Island from one coast to another coast. And that was a, a wild idea I had. And this was also when wingsuits were, were quite new, and, and it was a wonderful thing to be involved with, jumping in a different part of the country in an unfamiliar location and taking on something that was a, a good hardcore challenge. There has been a, a huge development in wingsuits over the last few years and the performance has been getting better and better and it is one of the, the new frontiers of the sport. I've done two trips to Kuala Lumpur to jump off the KL Tower and both trips was with Miles Dasher from the Red Bull Air Force. And Miles is a very special, unique individual, and we get on like a house on fire. One of the favourite things I've done with Red Bull is to do a parachute jump with a Red Bull event tent, the wigwam. Every time I'd been to any kind of Red Bull event when the wigwam tents had been pitched, I'd stand underneath one and look at it from underneath. And I always thought, you know, these tents are the, about the same size as a parachute and they're about the same shape. I bought some parachute line and went to an upholsterer, spent some time with him and did some modifications to the tent, added some parachute lines into it and then packed it up into a big deployment bag and ended up parachuting the thing from underneath the tandem paraglider. When you do something new like that, I've got confidence in what I've done beforehand to lean on and go, well, I've never done it, but I'm sure I can. And I think that's the secret to doing all the other stuff that I do. I'm so lucky to live in a community of amazing, adventurous people. And every now and then something happens and, um, you know, none of us lasts forever. I've been inspired by many people and some aren't here these days. Shane McConkey would be one. We did a mission together in China, jumping into a hole in the ground, which was pretty special. And uh, Shane came out to New Zealand with Miles Dasher and we went and jumped off a brand new cliff down in Milford Sound along with Sol Vallis. And people like Shane are just so sensational having people like that in your life. You know, he was a real dynamo, full of energy, just such a fun spark to be around. And I find people like that, they've just got this really awesome can-do attitude, optimistic way of looking at the world, and let's get out there and do this thing and go and have some fun. And uh, to be able to come to New Zealand, Milford Sound, Fjordland, unbelievable. The idea for Uncharted was developed years ago, actually, because I've done a lot of uh, recce's in the backcountry, looking for new cliffs and new places to go and just seeing what scope that New Zealand has for base jumping and big cliffs. You gotta love it when you get the email from Chuck Berry. I've been looking at Terra Peak for eight years, ten years. It's been on my list of things to do. 
Yeah, that's part of the, the beauty of this sport is uh, we're finding cliffs that no one's ever jumped. And when no one's ever jumped off of something, it's not just the novelty that no one's ever jumped it before. That's nice. But you have to figure it out. But if no one's ever done it before, you kind of you kind of get that excitement of figuring it out first. So it's super cool to find somewhere that was it was jumpable and it was on, it was really good. So we all jumped it with wing seats and it was the first wing seat base jump that I'd ever done in New Zealand. And it just that jump was so special. Absolutely beautiful place. It was a cliff that hadn't been jumped before. And jumping it with a wingsuit gave us really long free falls, and that was the longest base jump free fall that I've ever done in New Zealand at that stage. And that opened up just a whole new world for a new kind of flying and a new kind of base jumping. The Remarkables Mountain Range is a big local landmark in Queenstown, it's what Queenstown looks at. And after having skydived next to it for a living for a bunch of years, flying a wingsuit down a hill like that is the closest that I've ever got to the kinds of flying dreams that I had when I was a kid, where I used to imagine myself just off the ground, zooming along the ground. And this is what a wingsuit does for me when I'm flying down a mountainside. You're close to the ground and you just, you've got your arms out and you're pointing your toes and you're making the suit fly as best you can and you're just following the ground, ripping down the hill. And that is the closest I've ever got to the kinds of flying dreams that I had when I was a kid. So when you're wearing the wingsuit in the air, you are a complete total flying machine. So what you're flying is your whole entire body. And it's not like an aeroplane where you, you manipulate the craft. The wingsuit is you fly yourself. So how it flies is all dependent on what you do with your arms and legs and your torso. With the wingsuit you can fly at a glide angle of about three to one. So now you're going forwards three units for every one that you're going down. So you can actually cover quite a lot of country. And it's completely different to traditional skydiving where you're just drilling a hole in the atmosphere going straight down. <laughs> but I do believe that it's, there's no point in being a victim to your fears. And I could have been fearful of that forever, or fearful of anything. And it did take me a wee while to figure out how to face up to my fears and look at a fear and try and figure out whether it was a real fear or a perceived fear. And try and figure out why I was scared about something and is it a fear that I've learnt from society or is it something I should be truly fearful of? So I think getting past your fears is a massive part of getting out there and achieving something new and different. Because a lot of what I do is really different and it's, I get a really huge kick out of it. But because it's different, that means that no one's done it before and there's no existing set of knowledge often as to what this new thing is. And basically I've just got to go with uh, my own intuition and planning and desire for success. And there's a lot that does go into a jump, especially when it's a brand new place that you've never been to before. And the first bit is finding a new location. And in this case, hopped in the micro light and went for a fly around the back country out the back of Lake Wanaka and flew up and down every valley until I had a few possible locations and flew quite close to some cliffs and, and had a look at some places that could be suitable. We Chuck landed the plane up um, the Wilkin River, which has been carved out from glaciers for millions of years. Um, it's a pretty narrow sort of a canyon going up. Um, so, you know, to, to do a turnaround when you've got 5,000 foot rock walls on either side and a, and a valley ending up, you know, a couple of k's up, um, you've got to get it right the first time. Uh, one way approach in there uh, and a perfect uh, opportunity for, for a base jump. So it's where the Tasman plate pushes over the Pacific plate and you get um, huge uprisings. 
with that dramatic upheaval of the rocks, you know, it um, some broken off below, so it gave a bit of an overhang. Didn't have a lot of room. It's only about 700 feet from his launch position to, to the rocks. and now it's just up to you. And it's just you, piece of rock you're standing on, and thin air out beyond that. It's just scary. Have you ever watched the ground come rushing up at you? Because as a base jumper, you can see the rock you're gonna hit if your parachute doesn't open. So heading to the edge, throwing the rock off to the right, and now heading When I got into base jumping, which is more of a head game than anything else, it's not a, you're not challenging the cliff or anything like that, you're just challenging your own mind and your own personality as to why you want to go off and do something that's obviously scary and dangerous. It's a marginal site, it was 45 degrees and we just had a snowfall the night before so it's pretty slippery. I didn't have a problem putting Chuck out, he's a professional uh, guide himself in the mountains so he's very aware of, of those sort of conditions. I just have to put the helicopter very steadily onto a position so that he can get out. If he does slip, he can still grab hold of the skid to uh, balance himself again. You know, he wouldn't want it much steeper because, you know, contacting with the blades, we had sort of a few feet um, blade separation from the rocks. And there is something really special when you are stepping off the edge of a cliff and you're putting yourself completely out there. You've stepped away from the real world that we all know and understand on a daily basis into this completely foreign place where you've always been taught that it's a really bad place to be and you shouldn't be there. This is what my life's all about, is facing up to challenges, doing stuff that most people would run away from. <sighs> yeah, it's still there. Third jump of the day and it still hasn't gone away. <laughs> My heart's going. <laughs> Definitely, I'd be pretty cold if it wasn't. <laughs> yes, it certainly makes you sit on the edge of the seat though and watch it. Just, just the spectacular. Probably the thing I'm most proud of, just the, the, the man he is, I think. Okay, all his adventures are fantastic, but I think I'm probably most proud of the fact that he, he's, he's a good person, he's sensitive, he's caring, uh, he lives life to the full. Yeah, well with Chuck I think it's all about the love. He'd do anything for his friends, he'd do anything for anybody. It's, it, Chuck Berry's a legend. <laughs>